Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. Oh, this is a special one. Uh, The person that we are talking about on today's show uh, could easily be said to have shifted and perhaps even defined the cultural visual landscape of the late 20th century thanks to his work on Star Wars. And if that sounds overblown or it seems like it's really only about hardcore Star Wars fans, I would invite you to think about the last time, for example, you shopped in a big box store. There were probably Star Wars branded housewares there or clothing items or even candy or toothpaste on display. I also see those sorts of things at the grocery store. And a lot of the imagery that we think of as so identifiably Star Wars came from the work of Ralph McQuarrie. He laid the groundwork for the visual feel of the entire franchise through his work that started in the late 1970s. And he worked on a lot of other films and provided some of their most iconic imagery as well. So this is going to be a two-parter because there's a lot of art ground to cover. And we're going to talk about the life and some of the work of Ralph McQuarrie. There will be a lot of Star Wars, I'm not going to lie, but one of the wonderful things about his life story, too, is that he lived long enough to see Star Wars become a cultural juggernaut. And as a consequence, he was interviewed a lot. And he is extremely quotable. Uh, He puts together wonderful turn of phrase sometimes, and his honesty and his humility about his work is really quite charming. So we have the luxury of being able to reference his own words throughout this particular story. And so in this first episode, we're going to talk about Macquarie's early life, which makes it very clear how he ended up being the perfect person to work on Star Wars. Uh, We'll talk about his work before Star Wars and then how he started collaborating with George Lucas. And then in the second part, we're going to cover his career and life after the first Star Wars film came out. So let's dive into part one. Ralph Angus McQuarrie was born in Gary, Indiana on June 13th, 1929. When he was one, the family moved to Billings, Montana, and they stayed there for nine years. This was a move really to keep the family afloat as the Great Depression began. They moved in with Ralph's grandparents on their farm. And Ralph's mother was an artist. She worked in pastels. And McCory recalled that in Billings as a child, he started to get interested in art because of that exposure. His grandfather was an engineer in a brewery, but he also found ways to express himself artistically. He published a regular poetry pamphlet, and he illustrated that pamphlet himself. Uh, His grandfather also painted in oils, so clearly there is a familial proclivity for creativity at play. One of the hobbies that Ralph picked up as a kid, which really continued to occupy his free time for most of his life, was building model airplanes. He recalled that he became really fascinated with planes at around the age of six, and that fascination never waned at all. This attraction to plane design and the model-building hobby really clearly informed some of the work that he would later become the most well-known for. He later said in an interview, quote, I suppose there's a sort of glamour about it. I've learned to know what war is about in the interim, but the interest in airplanes kind of hung on. Yeah, we'll talk about his exposure to war in just a moment. But uh, McCory's father was a wood pattern maker. And during the Depression, his work fell off. But as the war created more opportunities, he moved the family first to Seattle in 1940 for better job prospects than he could find in Billings. But it was actually while they were visiting Vancouver that he found a job in a shipyard. And so the family moved to and stayed in Vancouver, British Columbia, for the next eight years. It was during that time, as McQuarrie entered his teenage years, that he started to seriously consider art not as a hobby, but as a career. He described looking at the art in advertisements and thinking that or illustration could be appealing job paths. Just as McQuarrie was finishing high school, the family moved again to Seattle, and at that point, Ralph took a job in a bakery. And uh, he described in one interview like how he was, you know, basically like putting in and removing bakery items to the ovens. And that was not something he enjoyed. That job cemented his thinking that art was really a much better choice as a vocation. But he also knew that he needed some additional training if he wanted to draw for a living. And the YMCA was offering technical drawing classes, so he enrolled. So he worked during the day, and then he took these drawing classes at night. After he finished, he got his first art job with Boeing. And this maybe wasn't the coolest art job. 
He was illustrating a parts catalog. I used to write catalog copy, so I, I <laughs> feel an affinity <laughs> there in, like, your creative uh, interest versus your job. But he made connections there with a lot of other artists and continued to do his own work at the same time. In the 1950s, Ralph served in the Army after he was drafted, and he was deployed in the Korean War. He had initially thought that because he was working in aerospace, he might get a deferment, but that was not the case. And then he thought he would primarily work as an engineer in the Army, which is how he started out, but he got assigned to the 7th Cavalry Regiment, and he saw active combat. He later said that he never expected to make it out alive, and he had many brushes with death. He was shot during his service. He later told a biographer, quote, I got hit in the side of the head with a round from a Russian burp gun. I felt this tremendous bang, and it spun me for a second. It penetrated my helmet. A guy sat me down and put a bandage on my head. I looked down and found my helmet and put it back on. For all I knew, it had lost its temper, but it had saved my life. McCory was discharged and went back home, and he later described this feeling of being, quote, embarrassed to be around for some reason because he had seen so many of his fellow soldiers die in combat. This put a pause on his art career, but it also enabled him to move it forward because once he got back to the States, he was able to enroll at Art Center College of Design in California on the GI Bill. And at that point, he wasn't entirely sure what direction he wanted his art career to go in. He considered working in advertising or illustration or industrial design. But then he decided that commercial art wasn't really the right fit for him. It felt a little too much like being a salesman. So he quit Art Center and he went back to technical illustration. He worked for a while uh, for the defense contractor Litton Industries. That was from 1960 to 1962, drawing guidance and control equipment, among other things. But eventually, he went back to Boeing. He worked on images while he was there that were used in Pentagon proposals and brochures about Boeing's various projects. And he also got a little bit into film because he started storyboarding some of the internal films that the company was making for presentations. After a while, though, his work for Boeing felt less and less fulfilling, although his work there was spectacular. For example, when you look at his illustration of Boeing's Model 733 supersonic transport concept gliding above a lower-altitude jet and the land below that, it really looks almost like a photograph. But there wasn't enough variety in the work. The hours are also really long. He later joked, quote, rows of windows. That's what got me. This boredom may have been rooted in a more romantic idea of his art as well. And he later said in an interview, quote, I've always had sort of a dream world approach to sitting and sketching for myself. I go for the romantic and what looks interesting while half my mind is occupied with practicality. So he decided to move back to Los Angeles in 1965 in the hope of finding more fulfilling work in the art field. And he and two fellow artists started a studio together called Three Real Studio, and they took what they could get in terms of contract jobs. For a while, McCory even drew detailed illustrations of teeth and dental tools for a dental firm. And it was after this move to L.A. that the connection started that would lead Ralph to his most well-known work. And we're going to talk about that after we first pause for a sponsor break. It was while working in Los Angeles that McCory got a call to work on a movie, but not the kind of movie most often associated with Hollywood. As NASA's Apollo program was building up, they wanted to create coverage of the process for CBS News special events. And as McCory put it, quote, they were looking for someone who could do an accurate painting of a rocket ship, you know? Ralph was the perfect choice for this project. He could indeed draw rocket ships, and he also had worked on a number of short film projects with Boeing already. So he understood how a technical artist fit into production. He ended up working for a number of years with NASA and CBS, storyboarding out animation sequences for short films that showed the various trajectories and workings of the Apollo spacecraft. He also took a job for a while at Encyclopedia Britannica. He was working on a film about time for them when they hosted a screening of THX 1138. That was George Lucas's student film version 
well before he made the full-length version of it with Robert Duvall. And Macquarie said that his reaction to this was, quote, that's a really wonderfully good student film. I didn't really know much about student films at the time, but it struck me as really wonderful and excellent. But he didn't know or meet or collaborate with Lucas until several years later. He also started illustrating movie posters in the early 1970s. The first was a poster for a film called The Legend of Boggy Creek, and Ralph's art for it was a departure from the technical work that dominated his career up to that point. This shows a humanoid monster covered in fur traipsing through shallow water with a dark and moody background of trees and the sun on the horizon creating dramatic silhouettes and contrast throughout the scene. After that, he had a fairly steady stream of movie poster jobs. Yeah, I feel like when you read about his career, and we'll talk about this some more, but, like, he was always hustling, like, multiple projects at a time, in part, I think, because he was rather fast and he was able to do so. But early in the 1970s, two screenwriters reached out to Ralph for some assistance, and through them, his life took a significant turn, although this may not be who you're expecting. It's Hal Barwood and Matthew Robbins, who had created a screenplay called Star Dancing, and they were trying to get financing for that movie, but they needed visuals to show potential investors to get their ideas across, and Ralph was who they got to create those visuals. So if the title Star Dancing isn't ringing any bells, it's because this didn't work. Even though by Ralph's account, they all had a great time working together, the picture just never got made. Barwood and Robbins continued to work together and eventually wrote Dragon Slayer and MacArthur and other films that did get financed for production. Robbins also collaborated later with Guillermo del Toro on Crimson Peak. And prior to this project, McQuarrie didn't really think about science fiction as an avenue for his work. Later saying of his time on the Star Dancing Project, quote, I'd worked for Boeing and was in love with airplanes and spacecraft, and I had an interest in fantasy architecture, although I hadn't thought about doing much in science fiction. But I enjoyed working with Hal and Matt so much on their science fiction film, I felt like that was really the place I should be. I had found what I should be doing. The important connection here was that Hal Barwood was friends with George Lucas, and Lucas saw the artwork that Macquarie had created for the star dancing pitch and actually really liked it. So when it came time for him to similarly try to convey his ideas for Star Wars, it was Ralph that he wanted. But not long after they met, Lucas got to work on American Graffiti, which came out in 1973, and Macquarie kind of thought that the science fiction fantasy project that they had discussed had just been abandoned. He once told a biographer that George Lucas, quote, came by my house one evening. He talked about his idea for a galactic war picture, intergalactic war. He said it would involve all aspects of Flash Gordon, but done in a sort of 2001 manner with real high fidelity effects. And I thought, gee, that sounds ambitious, you know. And we said goodbye, and I never expected to see him again. (laughs) Obviously, that was not the case. In 1975, Lucas once again reached out to continue their discussion, as did Gary Kurtz, who was Lucas's producing partner at the time. The usual story goes that even though American Graffiti had been a success and Lucas was seen by many in Hollywood as a young visionary, he still found that he couldn't count on studio execs to just envision the things that he was describing in his space opera project. But there's a little bit of a myth or confusion here. Alan Ladd Jr. at 20th Century Fox was already on board for the film for about a year when Lucas regrouped with the illustrator. The reality was that, according to Kurtz, quote, the script was not easy to read, so we knew we needed artwork to show the crew. Macquarie's work was a little like a roadmap, something tangible that Lucas and Kurtz could share with their collaborators to let them see exactly where they wanted the film to go. Ralph described his next meeting with Lucas in an interview years later. Quote, Gary Kurtz and George stopped by with the script, and we arranged right there in a 20-minute meeting what I was going to get paid and what I was going to do. They wanted four or five paintings, so they said, just read it and find some things I thought would be good to illustrate. I learned that one of George's good traits is that he doesn't swamp you with tons of pep talk. His first script was quite thorough, but he doesn't hang over your shoulder. In another account of the story, Macquarie confirmed again that Lucas gave him a lot of freedom in those early conceptual pieces. He once said, quote, George gave me a script, and I went away for a while. He said, do what interests you. 
It was like hearing music and seeing what you hear. In a later interview, he described the freedom of this unfettered creative process as, quote, a special opportunity to start from the ground up, being able to create new characters, vehicles, and different worlds. And since when I started, it wasn't even clear that the film would be made, I didn't have to limit myself. Macquarie did a lot of quick little sketches based on the script. He described himself as a person who sees things as he reads. And the script Lucas gave him, which had the working title at the time, Adventures of the Star Killer, had, in the artist's words, quote, oodles of chances to invent interesting objects and characters. And he started showing those little thumbnail sketches to Lucas and Kurtz very early on to confer on what was right, what needed tweaking, etc., before he moved to the more intensive paintings. Lucas was also sharing with Macquarie the concept designs of another artist, Colin Cantwell, who was working on ships and vehicles for the film. Cantwell and Macquarie compared notes often, and as Ralph incorporated the ship designs into his paintings, he would sometimes go back and update the paintings as Cantwell's work evolved. He turned in his first Star Wars concept piece in 1975. It was of the two now-famous droids, R2-D2 and C-3PO, although they looked a bit different then. Ralph described his decision to start with this image, quote, I read the script early on, and there was an occasion in the script for R2-D2 and C-3PO to eject from a spacecraft and land in a pod on this desert planet Tatooine. I chose that as a moment in the film as an interesting way to show R2-D2 and C-3PO. I put those three things together, made a drawing, and made the painting in about two days all total. That was the first painting for Star Wars. That's one of those moments where you realize when he says all of this took him two days, like he's operating on another level. (laughs) Yeah. It's a a whole lot of painting to churn out in two days. Coming up, we are going to talk about how Ralph's art created instantly recognizable imagery for the film. But first, we will take a quick break to hear from the sponsors that keep Stuff You Missed in History Class going. You can see in those early production paintings that this first painting of R2 and C-3PO is where Ralph unknowingly changed culture forever. And when you look at any of the early illustrations he did for the movie, it's clearly his hand that brought imagery into the world that we are all very familiar with today. Even if you have never seen a Star (laughs) Wars... It is a safe bet that you know what an Imperial Stormtrooper looks like and that you could identify R2 and C-3PO pretty easily and that you would never not recognize an image of Darth Vader if you saw it. Part of what makes these images so compelling is how much they draw the viewer in. What's obvious and has been commented on by numerous prominent artists since then is how much movement and tone and intensity is captured in these pieces. They don't feel like static drawings, but cinematic scenes that look almost as though you might have pulled a frame from a film. He illustrated Vader in a defensive posture, holding his lightsaber in front of him, while the protagonist, then known as Starkiller, holds a saber in the right hand that has either finished a swing or is preparing for one. The two are in a sterile-looking hallway that appears to be part of a spaceship, with light spilling into the scene from a corridor just behind and to the left of the action from the viewer's perspective. If you compare this image to the finished film, it becomes apparent that the hallways of Leia's ship, the Tantive IV, are almost exact recreations of this painting's setting. And his image of the droids out in the desert that we mentioned shows the little astromech R2 with his manipulator arms extended, looking as though he is trying to plead with his protocol droid counterpart from the background. An escape pod is shown in the far background, its cargo doors popped open as it sits on its side in the sand. A huge rock formation looms in the far distance, and the entire vista just feels huge. Despite being bright, the empty expanse of this scene also has a sense of danger and even loneliness. Incidentally, actor Anthony Daniels has long told the story that it was Ralph's art that convinced him to take the part of C-3PO, which he originally wanted to turn down. The protocol droid, which at this stage resembled the robot from the 1927 film Metropolis, gazes directly at the viewer. The expression manages to be static and expressive all at once, 
Something that spoke to Daniels and made him really connect with the character. And much of that art that was created was driven by the practicality that McCory had developed as a technical illustrator. In his words, the design of Darth Vader was really one that started with thinking about how a human could survive in space. Quote, The first thing I thought was, shouldn't he have some sort of breathing apparatus if he's entering the vacuum of space? I asked George, and he said, fine, give him a breath mask. Which now we couldn't imagine him without. Even after the film was moving forward and Macquarie was called upon to make more images, he continued to produce both quick sketches and full illustrations at that high level that those initial illustration pieces had been. Ralph explained in an interview in the early 2000s that he just assumed that was what George Lucas wanted. Quote, I started with shots of the blockade runner coming out from behind a planet chased by an Imperial fighter. That was the first scene that I read and started sketching right away. I did some sketches of Darth Vader and R2-D2 right off the bat, and the sand crawler and some stuff on the Death Star. Then I started getting photographs of models being done by Colin Cantwell, and then Joe Johnson was brought on, and he started supplying sketches, and I would put those into my paintings, thinking that's what George wanted. That's what was offered to me. I made illustrations originally designed to sell the film. We could have dispensed with doing color illustration after the film was a go. I'm so glad they did not. Uh, Ralph's concept designs were then used by costume designer John Mollo and production designer John Barry and his team as the basis for the film's entire look. Incidentally, Barry and Mollo both won Oscars for their work on the film. And knowing that other designers would be refining the ideas that he was coming up with allowed Ralph to work really quickly. He would sketch and paint out things for George, and they were usually pretty close to what the director wanted, so they would just move right on to the next thing. And one thing that might have really helped here is that McCory was a well-seasoned professional at this time. He was in his 40s, he had been producing art for clients for more than two decades, and he was a great collaborator, but he was also confident in his skills and abilities, and he knew what he could bring to the discussion or add to a design that would serve the work. Ralph also created matte paintings to be used on film in Star Wars, specifically the planets and the Death Star. This was work that he did alone in his garage, Harrison Ellenshaw from Disney was also doing matte paintings for the film and was the supervisor, and the newly formed ILM was based in the San Fernando Valley. But simultaneously, Macquarie had other jobs that he also had deadlines for, so it wasn't as though he could just pick up and move out to the ILM offices. So Ralph would produce these large, six-foot-long pieces and then strap them to the top of his car and drive them to the effects house to be photographed. He spoke about how his technical and mechanical style was a little too precise to really work well for matte painting because it just didn't feel right to a viewer. Quote, If you made a tight illustration that was carefully tickled up so that everything was reading to the naked eye there right before you, it didn't look real there on screen. We had to kind of blend things and make it a little casual in order to have it come off as a matte painting. I got by as a matte painter. Let's say that. When it became apparent that the Death Star he painted on glass to use for a shot in the film just didn't quite work, he had to take another approach. According to Macquarie, once they photographed his flat painting, that's exactly what it looked like. Quote, like flat art coming at you. The solution was to keep Ralph's precision work, but to add dimension to it. Quote, so we made this three and a half foot diameter plexiglass sphere, and I painted that and detailed it with tape and all kinds of layers of paper glued on to make details. And I cut a lot of little holes through the paint to let light shine through. We put a light inside of it and photographed that, and that made a very convincing Death Star in the final shot. There were innumerable other projects that came with the Star Wars gig. Macquarie produced promotional images as well, including logos and posters. And one of the projects that he worked on was a possible poster for the film, which was listed in the request for it as Fabulous Five, but which Ralph titled Fantastic Five. The main characters look a little different here. Han looks more like a battle-ready warrior and less like a casual, scruffy scoundrel complete with a cape and a lightsaber. Luke is a female figure wearing what looks like a blue bodysuit and tan boots and a fitted tunic. Chewbacca looks very, very different, wearing an armored tunic with a more orc-like face and fur that looks kind of bluish or possibly lavender. 
C-3PO still looks more art deco with Metropolis aesthetics still driving the appearance. R2 shape and various armatures look much like we're accustomed to today, although his blue accents aren't there. He's almost entirely white. The five are posed in the foreground with an orange to purple gradient sky in the background. Y-wings fly overhead and a proto Death Star looms in the background at the top of the image. This was only ever used on a magazine cover and never as a poster, which makes sense since the characters changed so much. There were later versions of this image with Luke and Leia in the foreground and the droids and Chewie looking a lot more as we've come to know them. But ultimately, the studio went in a different direction for the poster. And this is where we're going to end part one, because it's where McQuarrie wrapped up his work on Star Wars, at least for a time, and moved on to other projects. In our next episode, we'll talk about how things progressed after Star Wars was released in theaters and how the franchise became Ralph's primary work for several more years. Um, I have listener mail. Great. That is about uh, our interview with Jeremy Katz, sort of. It's also about everyone's shared love of Images of America. Uh, This is from our listener, Ari, who writes, Hi, Holly and Tracy. I'm writing because your recent interview with Jeremy Katz sent me into a spiral of book browsing. I, of course, wanted to see the book after the interview. I am Jewish myself and am always interested in learning more of our history. And when I saw the cover, I was transported. I worked in a bookstore for several years when I was younger, and we always had some of these books and I loved flipping through them but never bought any. I had no idea there were so many, and before I knew it, I had added way too many to my cart on my local bookstore's website. I ended up only buying two, Jeremy's as well as a Gays and Lesbians of San Francisco book, but I have so many I want. Definitely going to be a treat myself for some time to come. Uh, So thank you for reminding me about these and for all your wonderful work on this podcast. I really enjoy every episode. Uh, Thank you, Ari. They're so kind to send us this lovely email. I feel like that uh, episode restoked images of America love for many people, including myself, <laughs> because I similarly have a cart full of them. Uh, <laughs> if you would like to write to us, you can do so at historypodcast at iheartradio.com. You can also find us everywhere on social media as Missed in History. You can also subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app at Apple Podcasts or wherever it is you listen. This episode was brought to you in iHeart 3D Audio. To experience more podcasts like this, search for iHeart 3D Audio in the iHeart Radio app. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeart Radio. For more podcasts from iHeart Radio, visit the iHeart Radio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. <laughs> 